Welcome alumni and friends of this university joining us from South Africa, from the UK, from the USA and elsewhere in the world. Welcome to this recorded webinar. My name is Linda Murray and I'm VITS's UK representative based in London. Today, a hundred years ago, VITS became a university by act of parliament, but the official inauguration was postponed because of the Rand Rebellion and Miners' Strike and instead celebrations were held on the 4th of October, 1922. Nevertheless, the official statutory date on which Witz became the University of the Witwatersrand Johannesburg was the 1st of March, 1922. As a prelude to Witz 100 events this year, three former vice chancellors have gathered in a bar for a celebratory drink hosted by Witz's chancellor and other guests will join them in the bar later on. There might be time at the end for questions. So please type any questions in the Q&A box and join us for a drink. Please have a glass with your favorite drink ready or perhaps your Vitz mug with a cup of coffee in it. It's now my privilege to introduce our host. And our host is Dr. Nobutle Judy Dlamini. Dr. Dlamini, there she is, and she's the first woman to be elected by Witz's convocation to be the Chancellor of Witz University, a position she's held since December 2018. First qualifying as a medical doctor in 1985, and more recently as a Doctor of Business Leadership. In between those two degrees, she obtained her Witz MBA in 1999 and returned to Witz more recently when she wanted to study a postgraduate certificate in education. She also founded the Female Academic Leadership Forum at Witz a few years ago. Dr. Dlamini has reached prominence as an author on women in leadership. She is founding chairman of the Mbekani Group, and in 2020, Forbes magazine named her one of Africa's most powerful women. Our chancellor has arrived in the bar and I can see that she's about to welcome her three guests. Dr. Dlamini, over to you. Uh, thanks very much uh, for that introduction, Linda. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, uh, good evening, uh, Sunny Bonani in the different continents where we find our alumni and friends. Uh, it's an honor to host this uh, very special occasion when VITS turns 100 years. And uh, it, it really is an honor to be part of the family at this uh, turn of the century. I, as a doctor and recently a teacher, am joined in the bar by a mathematician, a historian, and a political scientist. All are former Vitz vice chancellors and principal uh, from three previous decades. My drink of choice, uh, I actually had to think long and, long and hard about this because I don't drink ordinarily. But then I thought, you know, in my culture, when you celebrate an occasion like this one, a hundred years, uh, you slaughter a cow or more. And each time you slaughter a cow, you brew traditional beer. Uh, those who know what I'm talking about, they know um umbut. So that's my drink of choice for tonight, staying true to my culture and uh, sharing a bit of it with those of you who don't know the culture. I'll actually start with our historian, Professor Colin Bundy. Colin, what drink do you have? Judy, good evening. I'm going to choose a glass of good South African red wine. Most people know that red wine improves as it gets older. It becomes more distinctive and more complex. And for a university that's got much better as it's reached the centenary, that is very distinctive. And I think Lisa and Adam will agree, can be quite complex. That's my drink of choice. Oh. Well chosen. And uh, just remind us, Colin, for those that are not aware, which years were you uh, the Vitz Vice Chancellor? My tenureship was rather brief. I began at 
late 1997 and departed in early 2001. Okay. And what did you do before that? I was an, I was an uh, academic historian at UWC. And then when my boss, Jake Scherville, got whipped off to look after Nelson Mandela's office, I fell amongst the administrators and became the deputy, uh, <laughs> deputy rector there. And I'm afraid, uh, you know, path was downhill from then on. And what happened after you left VITS? I know you write amongst many other things. I have continued to, I, I like to think I've continued to read and write and think. Um, I did some of that at SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies, where I spent just over five years. And then my last job was head of an Oxford postgraduate college. Great. Uh, thanks very much uh, and welcome. Uh, over to you, Mgwati, Prof. Lois Onongla. Uh, please share the drink of choice. Uh, the drink of choice for this particular occasion will be a beer. Okay. And not just any beer, but a Heineken beer. Okay. Um, two reasons for this. When I started as a vice chancellor, maybe I'm the only one who was put through a branding exercise. And the piece of advice I was given as vice chancellor is that as a vice vice chancellor, I should never be seen in public with a glass of beer because that was not the image of a vice vice chancellor. Heineken is a mathematician and he worked with the first black PhD in mathematics from South Africa, Ishmael Muhammad, who was associated with Vitz. They did wonderful work and they've got a class of groups called Heineken Mohammed groups. So I'll have a Heineken beer. Oh, that's, uh, I learned something new. I didn't know that. And uh, please remind us, what were the dates uh, for your vice chancellorship? Uh, I started on the 1st of June, 2003. And I was released from prison on the 11th floor on the 31st <laughs> of May, 2013. So that was a full 10 years. You, you make it sound so bad from prison, Prof. <laughs> <laughs> it can't be that bad. He's getting yeah, off uh, Prof Zeblon. i saying that in jest, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and before that, of course, I joined Vids uh, two years previously. And Colin was my boss. Mm -hmm. I was Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research. And before that, I was also with him at the University of the Western Cape as professor of mathematics and later on dean of natural sciences. Okay. And yeah. since stepping down from uh, the 11th floor, I taught mathematics at WITS for five years until I retired. And over the last few years, I've been really passionate to the extent of being parochial about mathematics in South Africa. So I'm a volunteer for a national consortium of most of the universities in South Africa, uh, looking at uh, improving the standard of mathematics and statistics across the system, especially at the postgraduate level and those that have chosen mathematics as a career. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thanks, uh, Prof. Uh, Prof. Adam, uh, what are you having for tonight? So I, you know, both my colleagues have done such profound explanations of the drink. I'm not going to be able to match that. All I can say is I'm going to choose a Bloody Mary. <laughs> I've been told that a Bloody Mary is very good for a hangover. And I think I'm going to need something for the hangover from my Vits tenure and probably for my new tenure that I'm currently involved in. So uh, my choice of drink is the Bloody Mary. Okay. Remind us your time at WITS. So I followed Louiso in 2013, and I left WITS at the end of 2020. So about a year ago. Okay. And uh, we know now you are at... Uh... So as at the mm -hmm. University of London. Thank you. Thanks very much, colleagues. Um, I, I now have the pleasure to propose a toast and if you can raise your glasses or marks, I'm raising my calabash.
So my propose, my toast is, may we produce innovative leaders who serve with integrity for greater good. May our spaces reflect strength in our diversity and may our staff accept our students for who they are and bring the best out of each one of them. Cheers. Cheers, yeah, yeah. To, to, not, to another hundred years. So I would like to talk about how the first hundred years of WITS inform the second century. Uh, and broadly, we'll look at just three areas, not because they are the only ones, but they are the main ones. That is students, staff, and space. To start with students, we have a very um, important picture of the law class of 1949. I don't know if you can show it. Thank you. If you look very closely at that picture and you look at the back on the left, the second from the left, that happens to be uh, the former president, Nelson Mandela. Oh, okay. And uh, if you look at the numbers, it was a very small class, but more importantly, you only have three women in the class and you also have based on the surnames because you can't really see complexion here you only have about three blacks so blacks and my, uh, and women were minorities at the time starting with you uh, colin were you at uh, when uh, we had the democratic uh, transition I suppose I came in on the um, on the wave of the transition, mm -hmm. uh, three years after 1994 itself, and it it was very very much something that um, shaped and enriched my tenureship. That sense of being of its being in step with very very important national priorities around inclusivity, um, around democratization and development, equity, development and democratization. And I think WITS lived up. Those are the, the, the targets set in the National Commission of Higher Education and in the Act of 1997. And I think WITS lived up to them. Great. Um, if we look at uh, 1949 and we compare it to 2021, uh, maybe you have uh, something to show on the recent graduates, Kilibokhile. Uh, how uh, how has that changed, uh, Colin? In terms of uh, diversity and numbers, it's very striking in that photograph. Something that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. How many women are in the photo? A majority, not a minority anymore. And generally, um, that's a photograph of. I think triumphant diversity. Mm. Yeah, we, we have to congratulate uh, leadership for making that change, especially when it comes to women, something that I'm quite passionate about. And we also have a yes. Do you want to talk to this, Colin? I did. I was asked to talk about student numbers, and I'm starting where people might not have expected it on gender because I was so struck. I was sent a lot of data by this, and I found this absolutely fascinating, that the, this is percentages of proportion of the total enrollment. And as you can see, between 1992 and 2021, in two decades, women rose from 42% of the total to nearly 57%. Men shrank from 58% to just over 42%. It's a very striking development, and it's one that I don't think has been explored or explained. Uh, if Luisa or Adam can, can explain it, it would be very fascinating, but it would be a good research topic. Mm, mm, I completely it, agree. It's not, it's not just the numbers. I think the importance of that first slide, the, the, the gender one, is to remember that there's a consensus in the literature on development that one of the greatest predictors of growth um, national, in GDP and elsewhere 
is the number of women in school and in further education. And in that very, very important respect, this is in step with progress. Judy, can I come in there? Yes, please, Adam. I mean, Colin asked, uh, notes an important issue and he said, well, where do we think we, that's coming from? And it seems to me that one of the things, one of the great successes of the post-apartheid South Africa is effectively uh, how it's opened up doors across the political, economic, and educational system for women. Now, uh, and so I think it's a phenomenon that you will see in multiple parts of the society. And that doesn't mean it's done completely and comprehensively. Uh, it comes with some real uh, terrible statistics on gender-based violence, on all kinds of things that uh, colleagues are very well aware of. But I think that the numbers that we've seen there is an opening up of the system. And that opening up has uh, at one level being the inclusion around racial uh, dynamics, but I think even more dramatically, it's the inclusion of gender dynamics. And that uh, I think has to do, uh, some parts I have to do with obviously what Wits did, but quite a bit is the opening up of the democratic political system and how that's created the impetus for this massive change. Uh, thanks, Adam. I completely agree. And uh, you touch on racial uh, demographics that have also changed. And uh, I would like to see uh, the different uh, departments, uh, Colin, uh, the change of the profile uh, in terms of race. And uh, I'm not sure if it also uh, shows gender. Uh, can we get this, the next slide, please? Yes. This one. Be before we look at this slide, let me just mention um, the pace of change during my term of office. I've got data from 1997 to 2002, just before and just after my term of office. In those five years, African student enrollment at WITS rose from five and a half thousand to nine and a half thousand students in five years. Black students more generally, African colored and Indian, by 2002, comprised a majority in all faculties. And in that, this outstripped all the other historically white universities in South Africa. And I'm not sure it ever really received the, uh, the recognition for that dramatic and committed change. This table, this um, slide up at the moment, tells that story again, I think very vividly. It uses the old apartheid and now still in use racial um, categorizations, Africans on the top, whites at the bottom, and just the, the shape of the graph. I've selected three years to tell the story, 92, 2008, and 2021. And you can see that very, very vivid um, change reflected here at the faculty level. Mm. The, numbers, uh, yes. the numbers tell their own story but I don't think we should just regard them as a set of numbers because what those numbers translate into is opportunity. They translate into the life-changing experience, the intellectual engagement and all the other benefits that access to university involves and that before this period had been denied to the majority of South Africans. So it's a very, very heartening tale. Mm. Uh, indeed, uh, Colin, it is. And uh, I, I don't have the numbers or the percentages, but quite a few of those African, especially uh, students, are first time graduates mm. uh, in their homes and their villages. And uh, it does change uh, the future of those people uh, in the villages that uh, produce a graduate. What is Thank interesting you. is that not only has there been a change in terms of uh, the complexion and gender uh, in the student body, but also the SRC, which is student leadership, has also changed. Maybe we can just compare the 1922 SRC, which we see now, uh, which is mainly white males, 
and uh, how many women? Three women, actually four. And let's look at uh, 2022 with SRC. I see our Dean of Students there, Jerome September. It, what is intriguing for me is that the number of members of the SRC have not changed, but what has changed is the profile of the members in terms of gender and race. Do you have any comments there, um, Colin uh, or Loiso or Adam? Can I say something that strikes me about this? Mm -hmm. So I think you're right, uh, uh, Judy. Uh, what is dramatic is the dramatic shift in the gender profile uh, and in the racial profile. And that is fantastic. It's as it should be in a society uh, like ours in South Africa. But what I also like about it is that it still has a cosmopolitan, a cosmopolitan feel. Mm -hmm. It still has students of, uh, who are white. Uh, it still has uh, a kind of cosmopolitan feel, but it's a cosmopolitan feel located in Africa. What Ashil Mbembe has used the term Afropolitan. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a wonderful description because what it does continue to say is universities must enable inclusion, mm -hmm. but they must always also enable a cosmopolitan agenda because that's what universities are. We are both part of Africa, but we are part of that world. And that's what I truly love about that picture because it says we are part of Africa, but it also says we are part of the world. And that's what we need. That's the symbolic message we always need to articulate. Mm. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. And looking towards the second century of this, uh, we are told that the numbers of uh, the population in Africa will double by 2050, and uh, we will have about 2.5 billion. What's important for me, though, is that more than 50% will be less than 25 years. So depending on what we do, especially as universities and uh, basic education, it can be a curse or a blessing. So how do we ensure, what advice uh, could you give to the VC, the current VC as to make, making sure that it indeed becomes a blessing? I'll start with you, Prof. Loisa. Yeah, maybe uh, the advice that uh, I can think of giving the, uh, the current vice and future vice chancellors is that, um, I mean, when we're looking at the pictures, we're looking at uh, demographics. Um, I'm here in a company of social scientists and I'm a mathematician. We're not talking about, we have not yet talked about uh, the question of class and socioeconomic status. Yeah. Now, there are some studies which show that university education favors maybe the middle class or the upper middle class, and it uh, exacerbates inequality. And fortunately, I think during the time of Adam, there's a center for the start of inequality or something like that, mm -hmm. that while the profile is welcome, but should also place, pay attention to not just, uh, I mean, ensuring that you don't exacerbate inequality by having just the middle class, whether it's black or white, being favored at this or attending this. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting you say that, uh, Prof. Loiso, because I'm aware that you initiated the Targeting Talent Program. Uh, tell us about that, because I find it as a way of trying to level the playing field, if you like. Yeah, when I first arrived at this, I mean, this was not the only one, the only university that had bridging programs or foundation programs. But when you look at the students who were admitted to those programs, they were disproportionately African from rural areas or from peri-urban areas. And when we did an analysis of the performance of those students, what proportion of them completed, 
uh, you find that there was a big differential between those that were registered for the extended program and those that were in the mainstream. And, and we, we, we felt that talent and the hunger to succeed was not a function of where one comes from. And that in deep rural Limpompo or Pumalanga or the Eastern Cape, there were learners or students with the potential to succeed at this. So the program really was going out, looking for students who had shown potential uh, through maybe being recommended by their teachers or uh, even people in the community. And we had a three-year program from grade 10 to grade 12 where we prepared them mm. to succeed at university. They did, they did not need to go to FITS. So the preparation that was being done for the foundation programs was in the first year. And we felt that we should do this before so that when they come to university, they are ready to cope with the challenges that they would face. So it's be, I mean, it's one of the things that I'm very proud of and uh, we follow on the alumni of that program, students coming, some of them coming from informal settlements, uh, mm -hmm. went to, went on to be char chartered accountants and engineers. Mm -hmm. It's still going on and, uh, and, and, and there are some universities that in fact have varieties of that. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Uh, I'm actually, I think um, Vitz is exemplary in trying to bridge the gap because having come from Bantu education, I know how intimidating it can be uh, to get to university, especially with colleagues that come from uh, education systems that were better than Bantu education. So just that, it knocks your confidence and it has a, a, an impact on the throughput uh, in terms of passing uh, at the record time. So uh, we need more of that because not much has changed, uh, unfortunately. Uh, would you like to add um, anything to that, um, Colin or Adam? Could I? Um, my advice to the future of it may sound very trite. The advice is to take university teaching absolutely seriously. And I mean by that to teach the value of independent thought, of openness to ideas, of the willingness to debate. I mean teaching that extends students, challenges them, and above all, develops them. That's a critical function of the university and it will be critical to the future of its. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, Adam? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. I think Luis was right. The targeting talent was a fantastic program and he should be truly proud of it, actually. Um, uh, and in particular, because it sustained itself over so many years. The question we have to ask, and I think it's what uh, Colin touches on, is given the fact, as you say, Judy, we've tried constantly to bridge the divide. Why is it that not enough people recognize it? Not enough people in government, not enough people sometimes amongst our student leadership, not enough people. And that uh, saddens me because I think until this institution is loved, and is loved not only by its students, because I'm convinced that 98% of our students love the institution. Mm -hmm. But until its student well, leadership love it, until its government, this government says, this is a jewel in the crown. And not of the South African crown. This is a jewel on the African crown. And we should be supportive of it, because this is the one of the instruments that we could make such a contribution to the globe. That message needs to, I think, be articulated more loudly by the new VC, by the new chancellor and yourself, and frankly, by the student leadership. Because the only way others will love us, the only way others will recognize us, if we have the courage to love ourselves. That's very true, uh, Adam. Uh, the only thing I would say, um, you know, in response to the task that you're giving us is that we live within a context, a context that is negative, challenges with leadership, 
And when we are a beacon of hope in that context, it's easy not to appreciate what you do and who you are. And uh, we need to make sure that we continue doing what we do. And hopefully the leaders that we produce will change the status quo. They won't be driven by what is good for them at the expense of everyone, but they'll be driven by Vits for Good. And it is my hope that it might be a, a drop in the ocean, but over time it will um, deliver fruit. Before I move away from students, I just want to mention something because it wouldn't be right not to talk about uh, the clever boys, the students as they were known, the Vitze football club. You know, there are so many uh, cups that they won, the Mainstay Cup, BP Top 8, Coca-Cola Cup, you name it. What in your view is good about sport in terms of building social cohesion and team spirit within the, the student body? Anyone? I think it's I think it's central, to be honest. I think you can't have an imaginative mind without pushing and ensuring that it's a whole, it's a holistic experience. Exactly. And and that the fact that there's been such good work on rugby, I'm thrilled that Wits Rugby has returned. I'm I'm saddened by what happened in the last years around uh, the clever boys. And I do hope we have uh, an intervention that allows that to emerge in some ways. But you know, don't forget the small exporting goods uh, with basketball, particularly the women's team mm -hmm. were fantastic. They did well globally, they did well nationally. Our sports have done incredibly well over the last 10, 15 years. And it's something that we should celebrate more. We should popularize more and we should recognize more, I think. Mm -hmm. Especially women's sport, I completely agree with you there. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, you, you mentioned the, the Clever Boys, yeah. um, the, 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 the football club. Uh, it's amazing the extent to which it gave identity to the university when you are outside of the university. Eastern Cape and so on, I was, I was viewed as an owner of a professional football <laughs> club and I didn't say, no, I don't own it. And then one of the things that I found up music from time to time was when we played the teams around Johannesburg, uh, whether it's Kaja Chiefs or Orlando Pirates, and uh, there would be a section of these students who were in fact backing the, uh, the other teams. And I was saying, no, how can you do this? You must be backing the clever boys. So, I mean, it, 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 it's a team that, that gave a sense of identity to the university. You will say this or this has got this football club, which was which was which was heartwarming. No, it, it was special. Thanks. Uh, moving to staff, um, which is the second leg of uh, our discussion. Um, it's actually interesting, um, Ngwati, that you have been the first uh, black verse, first uh, black African road scholar first black vice chancellor at Wirtz. What does being a first say to you? And what, does, what obligations does it uh, give you in your view? Um, I mean, first of all, I never planned the career path that I followed mm -hmm. and it's, people around you who sometimes make comments that make you pause and think that they see something in you that maybe you have not seen in yourself. Uh, I remember the only time I hiked up Table Mountain, um, it was with a colleague. And at that time I was acting vice chancellor and enjoying being deputy vice chancellor. He asked me whether I intended applying for the job when it was advertised. And it's something that never crossed my mind. And it meant a lot to me that somebody who had actually been in that position thought that 
mm. I was suitable to be considered for that position. Mm. And also for the Rose Scholarship, I think I, I didn't see the importance of the Rose Scholarship until much later after I'd come back from Oxford. But again, it was somebody uh, from Rose University who was on the selection committee who encouraged me to apply. Now, being especially the first vice chancellor, black vice chancellor at this, which is a, was a historically white university and one of the top universities in South Africa or on the African continent. There was always an association and that has not gone away that when you change the demographics of any institution, then the standards drop. Mm. So there was always at the back of my mind that <clears throat> whatever the standards are, there should not be uh, a conclusion made that <clears throat> when VITS transformed into a more representative uni university in terms of the demographics, you didn't find a situation where VITS now was lagging behind. And, uh, and therefore the, the, some of the programs that we, 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 we developed during the time that I was there was specifically transformed, but at the same time, not just maintain the standards, but also lift up the standard of the institution in terms of teaching, in terms of research, in terms of community outreach. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's, that's very important. Uh, I remember during Adam's days, he would talk about a uh, transformation being uh, the, the other side uh, of the coin uh, with excellence, because if you look at how VITS has transformed in terms of the profile, uh, uh, in terms of gender and race, uh, excellence has actually even improved. And during uh, your time, um, we, we actually, you had a 21st Century Research Institutes uh, started and the uh, first center of excellence in 04, 2004. Yeah, the centers of excellence, the, uh, the first cohort of centers of excellence Mm -hmm. um, we awarded around about 2004, and, and we got the lion's share of that. I think there were seven of them, and we were involved in at least three. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, that was, it's a recognition of the excellence in research that was already taking place at WITS. Mm. Uh, I actually don't want to move away from this before acknowledging Colin. Um, it, it's always difficult to make the change and be the person that becomes the midwife to change. And that's what you did when you gave uh, uh, Prof. Loiso the opportunity. What informed that, uh, Colin? I think it was a very selfish choice. I'd worked with Loiso. Um, he was Dean of Science at UWC and admired greatly that unmistakable facet called leadership. Luiso gave leadership to the scientists at UWC, and I was thrilled when he accepted the opportunity to come and do the same at this. Mm -hmm. At that stage, um, the vice chancellorship wasn't vacant, but as he correctly remembers, I was very, very um, sure, right up on the top of Table Mountain and elsewhere, that um, mm -hmm. the, the leadership was real, and he certainly demonstrated that. We thank uh, you for that. Uh, I don't think we celebrate enough people that take the leap uh, to recognize excellence across color and across gender, because that's what it takes to transform. We never ask people to lower the standards. We just want them to be open that talent can come in any race and any gender, any social and sexual orientation. We appreciate that. Uh, there is another mathematician, uh, Prof. Loiso uh, T.W. Kambule, uh, that uh, one of the buildings uh, is named after. Do you want to talk briefly about that? Yeah, Undata Kambule was, was an amazing man. Um, I uh, went to university with his son, uh, even before I met him. Uh, he had a reputation of, of, of being a good mathematics teacher. I think he was a, he was a principal at one of the uh, schools in Soweto. Mm -hmm. And then 
he came to work for Vits as a tutor. Uh, probably there's a story to that uh, because even Sobu Ukwe, Robert Sobu Ukwe, when he was at Vits, I think was an assistant lecturer or tutor. Yeah. Uh, these are the employment policies at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, we, I think at the time that he was, it must have been maybe the 40s or 50s, um, mathematics was, you, you know that fe, fe, uh, infamous quote by Bervut, what is the use of teaching a bantu child mathematics? What is it going to do with it? And, and mathematics was not taught at many schools. And, and it was seen as a gateway to certain professions, maybe medicine, uh, there were no chartered accountants, maybe, not maybe, uh, no black engineers. And, and there are people, the older generation that went through his hands who really looked up to him as a very good uh, teacher. I remember the um, uh, accolades and so on when he passed on. So this connection then of naming a building of housing the departments of mathematical sciences at a university, which is one of the leading universities for mathematics in South Africa, after this son of the African soil was something that was an inspired choice. Um, I, and I commend the people who took that decision. I think it was during the time of uh, Adam and, and Zeblon was part of that. Um, and, and, and this party, I'll talk about it later on, this complex here, is one of my favorite spots at, I mean, locations at VITS uh, with mathematical sciences and, 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 and the VITS science stadium. Uh, thanks very much for that. And again, I want to thank uh, Prof. Adam and uh, Zeblon. Uh, because when you see something that looks like you or sounds like you, uh, you actually get inspired. It makes success accessible. So we thank you for that. Kilibukhile, there is um, a 2005 General Assembly slide that I would like to talk to. If you can just show it, please. I understand that it's not often that a university calls for a general assembly, a graduation ceremony. And uh, you saw this fit um, to, to do it. Um, uh, what informed that? The number of things that uh, we experiencing at the time that we felt there was a need to call the General Assembly. Mm -hmm. um, we had a strategic plan that we approved in 2005. And the straight line there was VIS 2010, a university to call our own. Because we felt that all South Africans, irrespective of race, gender, where they come from, should have a sense of ownership of this university. I'm probably paraphrasing what Adam was saying, that this is an asset for South Africa, is something that should be, that we should be proud of. Now, I realized in talking to people in my first three or four years, that there were a number of prominent black South Africans who were graduates of VITS, but did not want to have any association with VITS. Now, that meant that this could not be seen as a university that is embraced if the people who studied there themselves had bitter memories about their experiences at WITS. Now, during the open years, as it is called, uh, there was a, should we say, a boycott of graduation ceremonies. Uh, because as some of the people in the audience know is that People needed a permit to apply to attend universities like this, UCT, Rhodes, and so on. Mm -hmm. So the Black graduates felt that although they had received uh, these degrees from this, they did not show up for the graduation ceremonies to receive their certificate, many of them. So we had a symbolic graduation for people that had completed their degrees previously. And it also was an opportunity to acknowledge 
the hurt that they had felt they had experienced as students at WITS. Uh, there are horror stories that one kind of hears or listens to when you go to the Eastern Cape or other places. And mainly there were some lecturers, we must be open about this. There were some lecturers who doubted whether black students in general or African students in particular were capable of completing a degree in engineering. And of course, we know the story about uh, former President Mandela, that's a classic example, where his professor felt that he could not make it as a lawyer. So that, that was, that was, that's what lay behind this symbolic get together and the graduation. And it was a special occasion, Chancellor. Mm -hmm. That's very uh, important, um, Loiso, because it's all well and good to change the numbers, but you then need a culture that embraces diversity. You need practices that embrace diversity because as long as you still have staff that can have prejudice and act it out with no recourse, then it will remain just that numbers and we won't get the best of the different people uh, that were originally minorities entering these universities. I think uh, Prof. Colin talks about how we failed Mandela to just go back uh, to how um, that issue uh, around uh, Mandela and uh, Blacks and females, according to the dean at the time, saying that they don't have what it takes uh, to become advocates. I don't know if you want to come in there, Colin. Okay. Uh, moving on. Uh, oh. I lost, um, I was taken out of Zoom for a moment. I'm back now. I'm trying oh, to get the screen up properly. Sorry, I, I, so I missed that. Did you have a question for me? Yes, uh, I was just uh, following up on what um, Prof. Loiso was saying about yes, some professors not believing that Blacks, especially Africans, have what it takes to pass certain degrees. Uh, and we're using the example of uh, advocates, uh, which was uh, what the Dean at the time believed that Africans and females don't have what it takes uh, to be advocates. And uh, you wrote somewhere that uh, as VITs we failed uh, Nelson Mandela. Uh, I just wanted to hear if you want to add any comment to that. No, I think it's very important recognition. I think this has done a great deal to acknowledge it, but it's a reminder of the, the realities of society that is so deeply riven by racial divisions and racial prejudices that a university has to be especially alert um, and, and take positive steps to overcome that. Mm. Thank you, thanks very much for that. Uh, moving to spaces. When it comes to spaces, uh, COVID has redefined what is defined as a space. And it was during your time, Adam, and uh, I was a student at WITS, uh, you know, a mature student, uh, when uh, we had to change the way we do things uh, because of uh, COVID. Uh, do you want to talk around that, having to go into online and also just during that phase, how you adapted? Because as a student, I believe you did it so well. So Judy, I think that that's right. I think, uh, so I should start by saying, I think blended learning was coming. It wasn't like it was completely foreign to us. We knew it was coming at least five, six, seven years earlier. Mm -hmm. What COVID did is it uh, aggravated the crisis and you know, it, it, it put its front and center in a most traumatic way. And it seemed to me that there were two reasons why WITS was one of the first universities out, out of the block to be able to adapt to a new form of learning. The first was uh, since 2016, we had invested about 500 million Rand in new networks. We were investing a large amount of money 
in modernizing WITS IT infrastructure. So when the pandemic hit, the technology infrastructure had just about come online, uh, which speaks to Colin and, and Luisa's uh, reflections on excellence. But the second part is the political legitimacy of WITS. Because the first responses you will remember that came out is that effectively we shouldn't do anything, that what we should do is close our universities because it's an inequality. Mm. And you will recall, we went public. We led the debate saying, mm. social justice is not about the lowest common denominator. Mm. It is about recognizing inequality and doing something about it. And what it, we did is I recall we sent, and Zeblon played a particularly important role in that. We put together 4,000 computers, which we shipped around the country, mm. assisted by the post office to every student that didn't have a laptop. We negotiated with mobile companies that they provided uh, technology, the kind of network capability so they could link up to it. So that particular dramatic move we were able to do, both because we had the technology base, the excellence infrastructure, and second, the political legitimacy, the commitment to take on very powerful political stakeholders and say, no, that's not how you deal with it. This is how you deal with it. And I think we shifted the system. What I think that that poses, and it'll be lovely to get Luisa's and uh, uh, Colin's views on this, is I think that what it means going forward is blended learning is going to be a part of our future. You're never going to learn exactly as we, le we, were le we learned in, uh, previously. We're going to have some parts of our learning done uh, online, some parts of it done physical and how we move between the two. We also need to partner between universities from the North and South, and they need to come together to teach. So you can take a course in WITS, you can take a course in SOAS, you can take a course in London, you can take a course in uh, Mumbai, et cetera. That ability of networks, because that allows us to change uh, on scale, to train on scale. We've got lots of people, you said many under 25s, but more importantly, it has to recognize that all of our challenges are global. This pandemic, climate change, renewable energy, and you can't find local solutions. It's mm -hmm. about bringing the local and the global together. It's about bringing institutional capacity around the world together. And so the, we're going to have to reimagine learning. And it seems to me that Zeblon and the vice chancellors that follow have to be part of taking bits as part of a global network of universities to train the people of our world. And I think that that's how we have to reimagine higher education in the next hundred years. Mm. Uh, I completely agree, uh, Adam. I don't know if uh, Louisa and Colin, you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's something that uh, happened after I retired. And uh, I think these guys responding to the lockdown and having blended learning must have been a major task. But I see so so much opportunity, as Adam has pointed out, not only at the undergraduate level, but also at postgraduate level, as well as young academics, not being constrained by where they work or where they are registered. One of the things that I've been very critical about in South Africa is our graduate training. Uh, we make our students specialize too early. And as a result, they become narrow and not broad enough to see the connections between what they do and how relevant it could be uh, in other areas. And now, as I think, again, just paraphrasing what Adam was saying, but at the postgraduate level, instead of a student kind of working on a narrow project, they can be attending advanced courses which are offered at um, University of uh, Alexandria, or uh, Oxford University, I have to mention Oxford University, and so on, mm -hmm. uh, that their interests will not just be dependent on the people immediately around them within their university, that they can specialize in things that are offered elsewhere. 
And our young academics don't have sufficient profile globally because in order to interact with your peers, you need to go to a conference and you have to satisfy certain stringent conditions. But now you can attend conferences virtually and mm. interact with people virtually and collaborate virtually. So it opens horizons for people to see way beyond their university and beyond the borders of our country and be part of a global community. Mm. That's, uh, that's very true. Do you want to come in, Colin? Just like to endorse what both Adam and Louisa have said, they're basically arguing that having tasted the benefits of blended learning, we're not going to walk away from it. Mm. There is, or there are strata, strata of academic conservatives who are very skeptical about blended learning. We've all encountered them. Mm. I like to say to them, would you like to go back and do all your research without the internet? without library access across the world, et cetera. Um, they wouldn't want to do that. And it seems to me to be perverse um, not to want to embrace blended learning as well. Uh, Can I just say one, one final thing on this? Yeah. Um, and it seems to me that one of the things we mustn't forget as much as we go global and as much as we part of this network that we do, that the local has much to offer the globe. Look mm. at the research strides we made in COVID. Look at how WITS people, WITS researchers, were able to map out Omicron and actually warn the world about it. The world did not respond fairly to us, but it was us who said to them, this is a very, very different variant. That research capacity that we have mm -hmm. and the impact we can have with that research capacity, both in South Africa and the world must not be forgotten. And I think it's something we should always remember. In field after field after field, we have a dramatic impact in the local and in the global. Thank you. Uh, I'm enjoying chatting to you so much that uh, we're running behind. Um, talking about space, obviously there's more to space than uh, virtual. Uh, going back to the land of footprint, um, what has happened over the hundred years is that the land space has actually increased fourfold. And um, that actually excludes buildings, you know, the square metrage of buildings, just talking about uh, the, the footprint of this. Um, I would like um, each of you to just talk about the changes that you are proud of. Uh, thanks, uh, Here we're looking at just some of uh, the property that is owned by WITS. The West Campus, uh, which is the old Rand uh, showgrounds, was acquired in the late 1980s. And the stadium from the Ren Show was converted in 2009 to the science stadium uh, that we have today. That was during your time, uh, Luisa. Yeah, that's that's one of my favorite favorite spots at uh, mm -hmm. at, at Vitz. I can talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah, this picture here. Um, in fact, just two or three buildings that I can talk about here. Uh, people who were at this maybe in the uh, early years, 80s, 90s, up to 2000s, uh, will recall the uh, there was a sports stadium just in front of the Tower of Light. Um, so we were looking at uh, setting up new laboratories, etc., and thinking about what to do with that big concrete structure, which was the stadium. And an architect said that no, you can you can you can integrate it into the uh, into the new building. So the right at the end on the left here, that uh, circular shape there is the original stadium, which is at the back of the auditoriums in the Viz Science Stadium. And this is the original Rand Show Grounds, a Milner Park Rand Show Grounds. And and for the historians or people who I followed these developments over the years. 
uh, the first attempt at the life of the architect of apartheid, namely Hendrik Vervoort, was on this site. And it was by a vice graduate, David Pratt, uh, who shot him and uh, he ended up being treated by interns who had qualified from VITS. And, and in front here next to the uh, parking lot here is a building that was funded by the Chamber of Mines. And I think this ran out of money and did not complete the, what is called the fourth quadrant. So it was only in my fourth or fifth year that I, we became, I mean, I became aware that there was a gaping hole there. So we filled that up and uh, that was called the fourth quadrant project. And whenever I, I walk around there, especially in the evenings, there's something that moves me about, about the West Campus and the developments that took place maybe over the last 20 years. Mm, that's amazing. That's a beautiful story. Um, Adam, do you want to talk about, it's more than just spaces, you know, the diversity of teaching and research site is also complemented by uh, VITS having wholly owned companies. Do you want to share those, uh, just a few words around those companies? Yeah, I mean, it, it, the thing that we've always said at, at WITS and I think is important is that if we want to have a social justice agenda and we want to have an educational agenda, we must diversify our income streams. We must diversify, we must have a diverse impact. And what is kind of useful about that is we've done great things uh, across the years. Uh, we, Ajun Court and WITS Rural and the work that was done uh, uh, early in the 1990s and through Colin, uh, around with rural. Some of the work that Luiso did in okay, taking buildings in Bramfontein in the early 2000s and buying cheap property. And you wouldn't have been able to expand with Chimolohong in that regard. Uh, and it seemed to be where well, Franken world under my period, how we managed to get that going. And now there's a major development there. Think about the WITS group. We got WITS rural. We got Simolochon, we got Donald Gordon Hospital, mm -hmm. we got uh, all of the multiple companies that, that we built, including some of the, the research facilities uh, that, that the research brokering services we provide. It's the diversity. We also had, you spoke earlier on about the clever boys. It's that mm -hmm. diversity of institutions it allows us to make greater income. It allows us to have impact, but it allows us to have, to say that we are part of the complex of South Africa. And that's what it's going to be important as we go forward in the next hundred years. We shouldn't have five, six, seven institutional footprints. We should have 20, 30, 40 of them. Mm. And hopefully that's what we will do as we grow in the next hundred years. Mm. Great. Uh, Colin, you must be proud of the decision you made not to close with a rural uh, facility. Um, do you want to talk briefly on that? Um, on my screen, my internet connection is unstable. So I'm trying oh. to minimize loss of bandwidth. Um, Go back to the when I was advised by my predecessor and colleagues that what was then called the Vitz Rural Facility was too distant, too attached, and too expensive. And there was a, a, um, a very clear intention of the Vitz Rural Facility. Fortunately, I was lobbied by uh, Steve Tolman, Barry Mendelo, and they prevailed on me to go and visit it. And I did so. And I remember it didn't look like the, the slide now. There were just a handful of buildings. And we landed in a tiny plane on a little dusty airstrip. I don't know if it's still there, Adam. Okay. Um, that's, that's how we go. Uh, and I spent a week or so on the site, meeting local in place, finding out what was going on, uh, meeting some of the um, activists in Bushbuck Ridge um, community. 
And I went, to cut the story short, I went back to Witz and I argued in Senate and in council that we retain Witz rule. And of course, I'm absolutely delighted we did. Because today, there it is. It is the hub of an internationally recognized um, center for rural research on mm. HIV AIDS, on migration, on health intervention, popula longitudinal pop population. Mm. And, and, and we so thank you for that. Is, can I, shall I, shall I end there? Can I, can I just also then say how that I would like to acknowledge that both Adam and, um, sorry, that Luisa and Adam picked up the baton. Luisa, with Eunice Valim, played an absolutely crucial role in securing the funding that made it look as it does today. And Adam, in his turn, um, I think was key to extending and consolidating the international linkages at Witz. Thank you. And in a very eloquent statement, um, Adam spoke in 2019 and he said this, just finding it, that Witz Rural Campus is part of the university's fundamental agenda as example of what universities need to do to change societies for the better. We are a bridge between rich and poor, rural and urban, local and international, and a link between different countries and communities. Cherishing it, Witz. Thanks, Judy. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much uh, to our three former VCs. Thanks for your leadership and the excellence that uh, you delivered. And uh, we look to the next hundred years, uh, which will be led by our new or current VC, uh, Prof. Zeblon Villagazi. Uh, if you can turn on your camera, uh, uh, Zeblon. And uh, Everyone joins the bar and chooses a drink. Which one have you chosen? I thank you, Judy. After Loiso's uh, take about you know the eleventh um, floor where I am at the moment, being a uh, prison, I sobered up. So I'm having a cup of coffee here with a vet. <laughs> We're sober in fourteen days, so I will have my cup of coffee. We'll drink to that as a block. Um, you have a, an enviable um, opportunity uh, of three former VCs uh, that you can ask a final question uh, to. And this is your opportunity. What's your question? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Chancellor. You know, when I saw the headline uh, with a picture, you know, of the three vice chancellors, uh, an historian, a mathematician, and uh, and a political scientist. I was reminded of a 1968 famous Sergio Leone spaghetti movie, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, but I won't put any order there. So uh, um, I thought maybe, you know, there must be some kind of a joke in this. So, you know, so I'm still looking for a joke. So nonetheless, I just want to ask the VCs, you know, to add a bit more levity to the end of this conversation, is when we were the VC, what was the funniest, most unexpected, or most bizarre situation that you, you know, found yourself, or effects you learned from vets? Um, I think I'm, since I mentioned no order in the good, the bad, and the ugly, I won't take it, I won't take it in any order. Over to you, uh, former VCs. Well, Zedlon wanted a joke. The joke that I'm going to tell was one at my expense. Um, in, in 2000, the um, deputy president of the SRC was a man called John Kuhn, who was a remarkable political um, activist, a scholar who got three first class degrees in his time at Witz, and was also an early internet entrepreneur. He set up the very, very influential um, site, Get a Life or Gal, there's a picture of it there, there's John at the bottom. And he devised a game during 2000, when a certain amount of discourse was going on on campus, 
inviting students to um, paint bomb the vice chancellor's Saab. And that caused quite a lot of excitement. That was first cousin to his game of throwing um, diesel at Robert Mugabe. And for that game, the South African foreign ministry intervened to try to get him to take it down. And my fellow vice chancellors will be sorry to hear that the government didn't intervene on the side of the Witz vice chancellor. Mm. Can I just add a word or two about John Kuhn? He was yes. a remarkable young man. He was one of the most memorable students I've ever worked with. He went to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar and died within his first year. Wow. He had made such an impact that his college named a society for him and planted a tree in his memory. And at Rhodes House, there is now a John Kuhn room. And for me who lives in Oxford, it's some consolation to know that there's a corner of that foreign city that is forever Witz and forever John. I've mentioned John because he was an exceptional student, but he's also representative. He's representative of what students and Witz students in particular can bring to us. The, the dynamism, the creativity, the originality and the zest for life. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, that's quite special. Thanks, uh, thanks, Colin. Uh, Loiso? Yeah, my story is is again about students, SRC, and and uh, I think in a democracy, the fundamental kind of concept is that your vote is a secret, secrecy of the ballot. Mm. So we had an SRC elections, and with a slate of political parties, mm. uh, and one slate. Progressive Youth Alliance. They won all 15 positions. And therefore they were going to decide amongst themselves who was going to be president, secretary general and so on. But the Dean of Students still has to call a meeting in order that these portfolios must be decided. So then the position of president was decided that it's going to be Mr. X. But Mr. X had received the fourth largest number of votes not the largest number of votes. Mm. So when it came to the meeting, his comrades voted for the person who received the largest number of votes. So when the Dean of Students as an electoral officer announced that the president was so-and-so, not Mr. X, he was so upset, disrupted the meeting and the meeting had to be postponed. So when Edwin Cameron heard about this, and I think he kind of asked him, by the way, why did you do that? The answer was, people should not abuse the secrecy of the ballot. That's a punchline. <laughs> <laughs> your, your vote may be secret, but don't abuse that and vote uh, according to your conscience. You must be told how to <laughs> That's so interesting. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, Adam, you have the final word on this one. I must say, I, I, I'm going to give you a, two quick things. One is a, a, a funny moment and then a really uh, lovely moment for me, at least personally. The funny moment is, as you know, I was, an, I was a student activist. And in the middle of 2015, in the middle of Fees Must Fall, we had this famous event, as you can see, with 3,000 students sitting there, and I was on the concourse in Solomon Mashlangu House. And I got a, in the middle of all of the drama, I got a, 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 a message, a WhatsApp message uh, on, my, on my Apple phone from an old vice chancellor in the early 1990s that I used to protest uh, against. And he, it said, uh, Adam, uh, karma is a hard thing, isn't it? Uh, I hope you understand that now. And the really lovely moment is in the middle of 2014 or 15, we had this ice bucket challenge in honor uh, to address motor neuron disease. And the SRC had uh, challenged me to the ice bucket challenge. And so I agreed and I was going outside the library and there of course informed all of the students that I, must, I'm coming to have the ice bucket challenge. And so I go there and there was, my son was around and basically he came to see this. And there was a young woman 
student adverts who also came to see it. And so I went there and they put the ice bucket on me. And in watching my son and this young woman, they were watching me and they started chatting. And today that young woman and my son are married. Oh. <laughs> Uh, and so in a sense, a really poignant, lovely moment that yeah. also came out of the Wits uh, yeah. stories. That, that's amazing. Topics. It's all such beautiful stories. Uh, thank you. Thanks uh, for my VCs. Uh, we've had a nuclear physicist join a mathematician, a historian, and um, a political scientist. Now we need an accountant. Uh, Stanley... Stanley Bergman, if you can uh, show uh, your video, please. We would like to see your glass or mug. Tell us what, you, what drink you have. So I have some very good. Chancellor oh. Lamini, I have some very, very good South African red wine from uh, Stellenbosch. But more important, my wife who's sitting next to me has rooibos tea. Oh, yes. So South and, African, oh, right? <laughs> and uh, I'm oh, afraid man. the rooibos tea, she's going to give me a sip because she doesn't want me to drink wine in the middle of the day because I would not want to drink wine in the middle of the day in front of all these former vice chancellors and particular the current <laughs> vice chancellor. Yeah. No, welcome. Welcome, uh, Mrs. Uh, Bergman, and welcome, Stanley. Uh, Stanley is the chairman of the board and CEO of a Fortune 500 company, Henry Schein, and chairman of the U.S.-based VITS uh, fund. Um, so um, if you can just reflect um, that the discussion, what uh, the discussion that we've had reminds you about WITS, uh, please stand. Uh, Vice Chancellor Lamini, this is really an honor. I would never have thought I would be sitting in front of a screen from New York City, speaking to this audience, including the former Vice Chancellors of WITS, people I've had the honor of working with uh, for several years, but all in one place. Uh, you know, Listening to today's discussion and the memories that this brings back to Marion and I and seeing the pictures, uh, you know, what it does is it relates very much to the time, of course, when we were at WITS. Uh, I graduated in 1973 as an accountant and married in 1974 as a medical doctor. And we left South Africa right after our graduation. Marion spent six months at uh, Baragwanath Hospital, and we decided that, um, I suppose we took the shortcut and, and left South Africa and went to first the UK where Marion finished her internship and then to the United States. We were relatively unmotivated to go to our graduation because of the apartheid system, but particularly in Marion's uh, case, people of color boycotted the graduation and the class photo. Now, fast forward. 2016, Mary and I were lucky enough to be invited uh, to attend the Wits Faculty of Commerce, Law and uh, Management graduation ceremony, for, and that included postgraduate students. Um, you know, Adam was there, Luisa was there, and I was on stage. The hall was packed with jubilant families and friends and a whole sea of smiling people. You know, the difference between that time being on that stage, watching that audience and the time that Mary and I were at Bits was like day and night. Mm -hmm. We especially noticed the high number of black women receiving PhDs. You showed a picture. We saw it with our own eyes. Mm -hmm. And what I would like to suggest, Chancellor Delamini, is for the audience today to take a look at a stream, a video stream of a graduation of South African students from WITS today. 
not only South Africa, but students from BITS today, and they come from all over the continent and different parts of the world. It's amazing what has happened in the last couple of decades since Colin Bundy was the vice chancellor, then Luiso, then Adam, and now Zeblon. Uh, the change is dramatic. And I feel like a little bit like Rip Van Winkle going up to the mountain and coming down and seeing a different place. Mm. The vibrancy of that campus today, and we've been back a couple of times since 2016, is a real credit to the terrific work of the vice chancellors, mm. because what they have done is they've scaled up the university. There's no, no question, you heard all about it. Uh, mm. They have expanded the, the student body, the academic body. Mm. They have done everything you would expect of leadership in a university of that scale and of the talents of these VCs. But what they also did is they advanced diversity without any impact on the qualitative aspects of the academic standards of the university mm. with limited funding. So from the graduates around the world, we want to support you, of course, Luisa, and of course, Adam and Colin, and of course, now Zeblon in your goal to raise funds, because that's what we want to do. And you can count on us. We express our appreciation to all of you for what you've done. Uh, Dr. Dlamini, you're volunteering to do this work. Thank you for putting in the time. You have graduates around the world indebted for that piece of paper we have called the degree from Brits. And we now want to support you in ways that we can Zeblon, my friend, Professor Velakazi, we're an email away. We look forward to welcoming you to New York City very soon, I hope. And of course, everyone else and Adam, going to visit you in London. Luisa, what a pleasure to see you again. I didn't quite recognize you because the beard is gone, but whoa, <laughs> you're looking young and I want to take the pills that you take to stay young. Dr. I recommend retirement. <laughs> <laughs> um, cannot comment on that. I'm the CEO of a company. I'm not announcing retirement today. But uh, and to Dr. Bundy, thank you very much, Professor Bundy, for what you've done. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, um, um, Stanley. Uh, we appreciate what you do. I'm so happy that uh, there is a VC next to you uh, in the same uh, profession as I used to be, medical. <laughs> I wonder if you still practice. <laughs> you know, you She's know how you have affinity. Spend, she's in public health now and is spending a lot of time in Africa. And she's right now in the process of working with uh, the dean of the, the head of the healthcare uh, system at uh, uh, at Ritz to advance the dental school opening in Soweto. Oh wow! Thank you, thank you so much. We appreciate what you do. Um, we haven't got time for questions, uh, but information about VITS 100 that we're launching today uh, will be emailed to alumni throughout the year. Uh, thank you for joining this online celebration. The final word, of course, has to come from our VC, uh, Professor Zeblon uh, Villagasi. Over to you. I thank you, Chancellor. Uh, I'm cognizant of time. I won't certainly be long. Uh, Mr. and Dr. Bergman, uh, personal friends and friends of, of, the, of the university and of South Africa, we thank you. Uh, uh, Chancellor, thank you for your excellent stewardship of this quarreling of these uh, three, men, three men here. Uh, you know, a true exemplar of uh, woman leadership. Uh, Colin, Mayeso and Adam, I'm truly proud, actually I'm very, angry at you for making my life so difficult. You set such a high crossbar that, uh, you know, so I really have a, a big mountain to climb in order to even what you've said. But I think this great institution, uh, friends, has been built on the great shoulders of many students, alumni, supporters, friends, and of course, the leadership that is uh, exemplified by the three 
great uh, leaders in front of us who actually have, in their own way, taken the university in great leaps and bounds. I was only left with one option when I, when I ascended to this position, that took a moonshot, which is why actually behind me, I've got a replica of a Saturn V rocket that took men to the moon. So we say this because as best enters the second century, we call all our vessels to support us. In these tribal times, we need beacons, as the chancellor said, because of what we can aspire for, not what society is. And hence our new tagline or slogan, best for good. We have over the last hundred years, since we were born on this day, dramatically changed South Africa. We'll continue doing that and doing it for good. As Stanley mentioned, we cannot do it alone. Luckily, we do have an extraordinary head start comprising 200,000 alumni all over, the, all over the world. We have walked, we have walked through our hall, inspired change, and left an indelible mark on our society for the last 100 years. We have, we have matured, we have nurtured intellectuals and innovators, discoverers and originators, problem solvers and problem uh, uh, posers, activists and artists, critical thinkers and thought leaders. All of these distinguished individuals that have come through our university have punched above their weight as represented by all of you here and Stanley. We continue to harness our intellectual resources for the betterment of society. As Adam mentioned earlier, best researchers are tackling some of the most grappling vaccine 21st century problems associated with the current grand challenges of our modern times, among others, uh, COVID-19. And there will be many more crises to come and vets will be right front and center in leading Africa into solving these problems on a global scale. The chancellor spoke about the African demographic uh, dividend. We need to ensure, because working with young people, that you don't turn this demographic dividend into demographic disaster. And universities play a central role in that. Remember, on a lighter note, that uh, September the 1st to the 4th is the best homecoming here in Johannesburg. I plan to travel across the United States, uh, Stanley, in, in, in Canada in May and September, uh, the UK, Colin, in June, and Australia in November. I'd like to ask all of us as alumni to enjoy ourselves and spread the word of best for good in support of our centenary campaign. I say, my friends, it's my oldest, it's my tagline, Chancellor, the best is yet to come. You ain't seen nothing yet. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, th th thanks very much, uh, colleagues. And uh, we look forward to the next 100 years. Uh, it's an honor to be part of this family. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, I think there is a video that uh, will play at the end. So don't log off just as yet. Over to you, Kilibu Khile. Betis, you're welcome. Tiago Amuheng. Feli Amuheng. You're always welcome. Nam Gile Gile. Itani Vit, Itani Blues. Kerata Vit, Kerata Blues. Sleeve a vet, sleeve free blow. Says Tani Blues, say Tani Vit. Love Vit, love the blues. Thank you. Go well. Thanks very much, colleagues. Bye. Bye. Bye.